Assalamualaikum and good day everyone. So today I'm going to give you a revision on your ECE. So basically I'm going to go through all your ECE sessions that you, you have had in your year one. ECE is a unique program as the faculty wants to mold the medical students and want to expose them on the clinical skills that you need to a master during your clinical years. So what are the objectives of the ECE sessions? So of course number one it is for communications. So communication is very important especially during history taking. So in your clinical years you'll be seeing patients and you need to take proper history from these patients. So in order for you to take proper history so you need to have a good communication skills with the patients. So this is one of the aims of the ECE. So for the students to have a sort of an effective communication skills to acquire history. So during ECE, you were taught on how to speak clearly, on how to take a proper medical history from a patient and how to utilize communication techniques. So this object is being met by the, of course, the lectures that you have, lectures on communication skills and also on the uh, role-play sessions that you have together with the primer and the lecturer. Okay, so the second objective is, of course, to understand the physical examination techniques. So you must remember that year one and year two, you are not supposed to really know how to perform this physical examination. So ECE is just um, for you to sort of see how the physical examination is being done. So this is only an exposure for students. So you need to know um, how to approach a patient when performing a clinical examination and to appreciate if there's any abnormal clinical signs. Not to worry, you will learn more about these clinical examination techniques during your clinical years. Okay, so the third objective of your ECE is of course to acquire essential clinical skills. So we are talking here about the um, common clinical skills that you need to perform like uh, performing ECG, um, measuring your blood pressure, to know where the peripheral pulses are. So all these are the essential clinical skills that can be exposed to the students in the preclinical years. So it is um, this objective is being met in various um, subjects like in physiology where you, you were being taught on how to perform the ECG, how to measure the blood pressure, and then you are able to relate all these findings together with the basic science, which is your physiology, anatomy, pathology that you have learned in the module. Okay, if you look at what we have learned last year, so basically ECE um, sessions are being spent over the whole years. So you have your sessions in GM1, in GM2, MSK, CVS, RESP, and urinary. So these are the ECE sessions that you have covered in year one. So of course you have your first lecture by the coordinator on what is ECE and you have your hand washing seminar. So I think here it, it is a very essential and very crucial clinical skills that you need to master. And then you have your lectures on communication principles on the history taking and also on your clinical examinations. So all these are lectures. And in MSK, you have your um, demonstration on range of movements. In CVS, you have your, again, clinical skills on ECG and BP and also on analysis of lipoproteins and cholesterol estimations. So these sessions in CVS are actually... Um, together with your physiology and biochemistry subjects. So in respiratory, you had your uh, 
again lung volumes in physiology practical as your CSL and you have your rupee in thorax so here you have your primers and you have your lecturers and you can sort of practice your communication skills so you also have your examination on the cardiovascular and respiratory system so if I'm not mistaken this was given as a lecture and also some uh, videos were shown and of course we have one session of clinical bedside examination during respiratory and during urinary you only have one session which is the urinary dipstick covered in biochemistry okay so let's go to the session that I have learned during GM1 so of course you have a lecture on what is ECE so I guess by now all of you have known and have understand what is ECE and the objectives of ECE. Next, the session in GM1 is actually your hand washing session. So this is a clinical skill um, session in which it is very pertinent and very important for all medical students to know hand washing, the proper hand washing technique, especially during this COVID pandemic era. Okay, so important for you to know is when should you wash your hand and then how should you wash your hands. So here is the um, eight steps of hand washing, the proper hand washing technique that you should know and also what you should do if you don't have a soap and clean running water. So I think all of this has been covered in your hand washing seminar during GM1. Okay, so this slide is uh, showing the steps of proper hand washing. This slide is courtesy of Dettol. So you can see here, um, it shows eight steps to hand washing. So you need to master all these steps. You need to remember and um, try to follow these steps as much as possible. So just remember, because this step is very important, um, this question on hand washing did come out on one of the OSCE examinations um, a few years ago okay so it shows how important hand washing technique is so please 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 always um, perform this proper hand washing technique okay so next in GM2 you have three lectures so these lectures are on the communication principles um, the history taking and also on clinical examination i think for year one and year two the most important um, thing for you to know is the of course the communication principle and the steps to history taking for clinical examination i don't think it's very important for students in year one and year two to really know in depth about the clinical examination you are going to learn more about the clinical examination in year three um, i think important for you uh, to know the flow of the history taking. This history taking is also being um, focused on in PBL. If you see PBL, you have your triggers. So usually trigger one is very short and then you have the other triggers which are very uh, quite long, longer than trigger one. So this is also um, teaching you the step in history taking. I will show you more about history taking in the next slides. Okay, so for history taking, so I have a few slides on history taking. So let's start off with the first slide. So for the first step in history taking, of course you're going, um, you need to introduce yourself. So history taking is very crucial because you're going to see patients in wards and also in the clinic. So the first important step is of course to introduce yourself to the patient and to the patient's um, family members if they are around. So you need to go to the patient and say that my name is uh, so and so and so. I'm a medical student from UITM, uh, year berapa just mentioned. And after that, this is very important for you to um, create a bond with the patient and the patient is uh, trust trusting of you 
Okay, so and then after you introduce yourself, you just um, tell the patient that you are taking history. You you want to ask the patient a few things. Uh, is the patient agreeable to this? Yeah. If they are agreeable to this, then you can start your history taking. So, a long history taking. So you need to know that um sometimes you need to take notes because you cannot remember everything that the patient said. So before you started to take these notes, you just uh, inform the patient saying that um, you are going to jot down something from the history taking process that you are doing with the patient so that the patient understand what you are writing. Okay, so along the history taking procedure, of course you need to maintain Good eye contact with the patient. Always look the patient in the eyes and always listen to what they say. Okay? And not only listen, you need to empathize with the patient's history. So you also need to show some uh, verbal verbal cues like when the patient said something, you say, uh, yes, okay, understand. Or some non-verbal communication like nodding your head, um, your expression as if you understand what the patient is saying. So all these are very, very important. So this will, um, this communication skills, all these verbal and non-verbal communication cues will uh, help you to build a good rapport with the patient and it's going to make your history taking easier. Okay, after introducing yourself, you need to know the patient better. So, of course, you need to ask the patient for their information. So, you need to ask the patient's name and the age. So, after you have known each other by name, then you can proceed to the next step, which is the um, asking the patient their presenting complaint or their chief complaint or their presenting illness. So, this means the same. So, presenting complaint is the main reason why the patient come to the hospital or to the clinic. Usually patients um, have some illness and you need to ascertain the reason. So um, for example, are you asked Pakcik, um, Pakcik, kenapa Pakcik datang hospital hari ni? Usually the patient will say, oh, um, Pakcik batuk nak. So basically, the presenting complaint is not long. So it is the main pertinent and main important reason why the patient seek medical attention on that particular after um, obtaining the presenting complaint then you need to know more you want to know more you must know more about the presenting complaint so you need to gain as much information as you can about the patient's presenting complaint let's say um, just now the patient come to the hospital because the patient is complaining of cough usually the pakcik will say oh pakcik batuk so usually the sentence and like that. So it is up to you to probe the patient to ask information what you want to know from the cough. Okay, so you can ask the patient um, from when the cough has been going on, what type of cough, those kind of things. So you need to ask more and more information. Okay, so if the patient comes to you with a pain, any kind of pain, so you can use this um, Socrates acronym to elicit the pain history. Okay, so example here is chest pain. Very common, patient will come with chest pain. So when the patient come with chest pain, they will always say, sakit dada, sakit dada. So it's up to you. So when the patient said that um, he has chest pain, so you have a lot of things in your mind coming okay so uh, this is just like pbl session so when the patient come in with chest pain you have uh, maybe 10 differential diagnosis of chest pain so from this differential diagnosis you need to ascertain which is the most probable diagnosis in this patient so you need to ask further questions okay so here comes your socrates acronym so the first um, S for sight, 
So when a patient comes to you with chest pain, you ask the patient, where exactly is the pain? It can be in the center of the chest, can be on the right or can be on the left side. So important for you to know the side and then the onset. So when does the pain, the pain started? Does it start suddenly or does it start a few days ago and is it intermittent or is there any trigger to the pain? So it is very important for you to ascertain the onset. And then you ask for character of the pain. So does the pain pricking in nature? So is it burning? Is it sharp pain or is it feeling like a uh, something heavy is put on the chest? So these are the things that you need to ask. And then radiation. The chest pain does it go anywhere? So this is a classic example of your MI. Let's see if the patient said, okay, the pain goes to the uh, tip of the shoulder, go to the left jaw. So you can sort of, in your mind, you can sort of uh, think of the possible diagnosis that the patient has. Okay. And then is the pain is associated with any other symptoms like sweating, vomiting, nausea, so you need to take all this into your consideration before you come into your diagnosis. Okay, and then the time cost. So the time, so uh, the pain, is it always there? Or is it always in the morning? Or is it always in the night time? So this is a thing that you need to ascertain with time. And then you need also to ask about the exacerbating or the relieving factors to the pain like chest pain maybe you ask the patient um, if you're walking is the pain becoming more if you're resting does the pain becoming less okay so you need to tailor your um, sort of differential diagnosis in your mind and you need to tailor the questions that you ask to sort of see the most possible diagnosis and then you need to ask about the severity so you give a pain score, like um, 1 is for the least pain, 10 is most painful, and then ask the patient to score the pain. Okay, so this is very important for you to uh, really gain as much information as you can about the presenting complaint. Okay, so after asking about the history of presenting illness, then you need to ask about systemic review. So basically here you're asking the patient about the possible symptoms arising from any other system. Okay, let's say the patient just now uh, with chest pain, come to you with chest pain. So automatically in your mind, you're thinking about something to do with the cardiovascular or something to do with the respiratory system. But you must also ask about other system. So one of the differential diagnoses for chest pain can be to uh, gastritis. So it is worthwhile for you to ask about symptoms about any system such as their GI system. Maybe you can ask about the um, nausea, about vomiting and you need to ask the relevant positive and negative symptoms that the patient may have. Okay. After taking the history from the patient of the current illness, then you need to step back and ask about the past medical and also the past surgical history. It is very important to understand the current history first and then you go back to the past medical and also the past surgical history. So basically here you want to know if the patient has had any other medical or surgical conditions before. If let's say the patient has um, diabetes or hypertension, you need also to ask for how long does the patient has these illnesses and the medications that the patient is on and their follow-up, whether they are uh, um, sticking to their follow-up schedule or not. Okay, so very important. So after that, then you ask the patient about their drug history and any allergy history.
So here you need to ask the patient about what medication they are on for any illnesses, whether this medication is prescribed by a doctor or any over-the-counter medication. So you need to find out. Even any supplement, herbal supplement, you also need to find out. Okay, so you also need to ascertain the patient's allergy history, whether allergy to food or allergy to any medication. Okay, this is very important because you don't want any um, allergy, you don't want to miss out any allergy that the patient has. Next, then you ask about the patient's family history. So here you need to ask about the patient's parents or siblings or the grandparents or uh, any maternal or their paternal uh, uncle or auntie that have any illnesses so because sometimes the illnesses have some genetic predisposition okay so very important this one after that then we move on to the social history so you need to ask the patient about their background um, their occupation the spouse's occupation, the children, and uh, where do they live, and the condition of the house, whether it's suitable for the patient or not. And then um, you ask about their smoking history, whether the patient smoke, and then uh, alcohol consumption, and any history of sexual promiscuity. Okay. Next, after taking the history, uh, Sometimes patients may have some questions or some feedback that they want to give you. Sometimes the patient are curious why you asking a lot of things that they don't even think of. So you have to explain why you want to take all this history. And sometimes patients um, ask you about their condition, whether their illness is something serious or not serious. So, uh, if you're not sure, so if you don't know, don't give them any false information. So, just tell them that, okay, you're going to discuss um, the patient's condition with your uh, superior, your consultant or your specialist, and you will get back to the patient. Never, never give any false information to the patient if you're not sure. Okay? So, after taking all the history, so important for you to summarize the history. So you have all your information, so you need to summarize and put it nicely in the flow, especially when you're presenting to your superiors, so that you are only highlighting the important or the pertinent part of the history to your bosses. So you also need to remember that um, for some special group of people, you have extra questions that you have to ask. Let's see in female, especially when you're working in the ONG um, ward or in the ONG posting. So you need to take more history, especially about their previous obstetric and gynecological history. So you need to ask them about the first age of their menses and their last menstrual period, about their um, menstrual history and also if they have had uh, any pregnancy before, is the pregnancy previously have any complications? So you need to ask this kind of questions, especially in obstetric and gynecological patients. For children, you need to ask the parents or the guardians about the uh, child birth history. Okay, so whether the baby is born term or born preterm, and how the baby is deliver or was delivered whether spontaneously or whether by cesarean section, is there any complication during childbirth? And also after the childbirth, you need to ask about the birth weight, the APGAR score, and also the developmental history. So the fine motor, gross motor, personal and social, and also the speech history. Also important for you to ask about the vaccination history in the children. Okay, so this slide is showing you the um, steps in history taking. So basically, uh, these are all the steps that I've been um, recapping to you about. So here is um, the steps in one slide 
So hopefully you can have a look and try to remember what you need to ask the patients. Next, in MSK module, you have your demonstration by the orthopedic surgeon on the range of movement of every joint in the body. Okay, so I think you can have a look back at your notes about this. It is quite simple, but you have to remember all the movements. In CVS, you have these four sessions for your ECE. So you have two sessions in physiology and two more sessions in the biochemistry practicals. So for physiology, you have um, your ECG and also your BP measurement. So these are the pertinent clinical skills that you must master. Okay. So for uh, before you start all this practical or before you start this procedure in the patient, these are the important steps that you need to um, go through first. Okay. So of course, number one, as before, you need to introduce yourself to the patient. So just say your name from where you are. And then ask the patient about the patient's information. You need to know the patient's name and age. And then important, if the patient is of different gender from you, you need a chaperone. Okay? Someone to uh, be there and make sure that nothing uh, hanky-panky is happening. Okay? And then afterward, you need to briefly describe what you are going to do to the patient. So let's say if uh, you are going to perform an ECG to a patient, you need to say that uh, why you're doing the ECG. You just say that, okay, pakcik, kita nak check jantung pakcik, something like that. And then you say that, um, briefly describe how you're going to do it. Just say that, uh, pakcik, just uh, baring, lay down, and we'll put some electrode on you. Just uh, briefly say what you're going to do. And then after that, you ask the patient for the consent. Pakcik boleh ke? Something like that. So usually, if you have uh, tell the patient what you want to do, the patient will gladly say yes afterwards. Okay? So after that, if um, the patient need exposure, okay, so that just expose the patient as the procedure warrants to. Okay? Okay. So I think um, you have had the chance to do your ECG practical and so your BP practical in year one, but we have come up with um, our video. So the physiology department has um, produced videos on practicals. So these are the links. So you are free to go and have a look at these videos. And hopefully you can refer back to the videos once you are in your clinical years. If you want to have a uh, recap of what you, you need to do. Okay, same in respiratory module, you have this um, lung volumes and capacity practical in physiology. I just noticed that you did not have this session, you don't have, you did not have the hands-on session because of the MCO, so uh, it's okay. So here is the uh, video that we produce, so you can have a look at this video. So once you come back to the campus, you can go to the uh, lab and try to do your lung volumes and capacity practical okay so again same as your uh, role play and also clinical bedside examination uh, you did not have the chance to perform this during your respiratory module okay but not to worry um, for role play i think you have had um, an idea how to approach a patient and ask question and then for examination i will go through to through, uh, go through with you some of these steps in the examination okay so um, i'm going to talk uh, briefly on the physical examination how to approach a patient for the physical examination so again you will learn this in uh, detail during your clinical years so again for examination number one the thing that you need to do is introduce yourself always always introduce yourself to the patient so once you have introduced yourself to the patient then ask the patient for 
his or her information you want to know the name and the age things like that okay so after that then you briefly tell the patient what you want to do let's say um pak cik saya nak check jantung pak cik boleh so when you say like that patient will understand and um, they will consent to what you're going to do okay so again you need to maintain eye contact listen to what the patient is saying and also um, be very aware of the patient's verbal and non-verbal cues let's say the patient when you touch the patient the patient is feeling pain then you can see the patient winces and you can see that in the patient's face then you have to stop and apologize to the patient so very important okay Okay, so the first step for physical examination after introduction and everything, so is in inspection. You need to look at the patient first. Do not straight away touch the patient. Look and see. So you don't only look at the patient, you also look at the patient's surrounding. Okay, so when you look at the patient, you need to observe the patient's general well-being. Whether the patient is well or whether the patient looks sick. So you also need to know whether you need to look for the presence of pallor. See the patient is quite pale or there's any jaundice or does the patient um, breathless. So things like that you must be aware. So this can be done without even touching the patient. Just see the patient. Okay. So after looking at the patient, then you look at the patient's surrounding. So you see whether the patient is hooked to any um, kind of driving this trip so just see what the trip is and then see whether the patient has any um, is on any oxygen mask or oxygen therapy and is there any wheelchair or crutches around the patient so all these things you need to look at okay so after looking and observing then you see the vital signs so you need to uh, look at the patient's BP, temperature, pulse rate, respiratory rate, and also the oxygen saturation. So these are the important vital signs that you need to look for in the patient. So after looking at the patient, looking at the surrounding, then you can go and put your hands on the patient. So the second step after inspection is palpation. So palpation is basically touching the patient. So you palpate the patient for any tenderness. If the patient has any um, mass, so you just, uh, or any lumps or bumps, you just see and examine and touch the lumps and bumps. And for um, cardiovascular examination, during palpation, you need to palpate and locate the apex bit. Okay. So in GI, you have to palpate the stomach for any mass. So in respiratory, you just palpate for the chest expansion and things like that. Okay, so look and then you touch. Okay, so after percussion, uh, sorry, after um, palpation, then the next step is percussion. So percussion is basically you want to know the resonance of the area of the body so usually percussion we we percuss the chest and also the stomach area so remember look touch then you percuss so after percussion then is the auscultation so auscultation here you can use your stethoscope usually we use it to listen for heart sounds listen to any presence of murmur so we are listening also to the breath sound and also listen to any presence of buoy. Okay, so you have your member inspection, your palpation, percussion and auscultation. Okay, but you need to remember that <clears throat> every system and discipline has its own set of examination. So let's say you're going to examine a patient's uh, neurological system. So it does not really follow this flow. Of course, the first one must be lah. The first one which is your uh, introduction. You introduce yourself to the patient. 
and you punya uh, inspection is there but they have other things that need to add on macam if let's say neurological they might have um, test to test the power tone the sorry the muscle tone the muscle power things like that okay so even for gynecological examinations it has their own set of examination same like pediatrics examination okay but then this um four steps inspection palpation percussion and auscultation is the sort of the core physical examination that you need to know okay so we have arrived at our last slide so um i know it's a daunting task from being um, a year two student and then going to year three clinical years so the faculty hope that with ece some of the shock of the transition can be cushioned by this ece session so ece is only an exposure so once you have um, exposure so you won't be that shock when you are in clinical years okay so um i think it's the end of the revision if there's any issue or anything that you want to ask about ece uh, you are free to contact me so thank you everyone and have a nice day